have some work we need to do. But they will be working next week. <laughs> Secondly, I am thrilled and excited and proud to announce our pastor for this transition time, Lucia. Lucia Jackson was with us in May for the Pentecost Sunday uh, church celebration service. It was colorful. There were cupcakes, there were streamers, it was a beautiful day. So, if you remember that service, you know there's an energy here. Uh, she will be performing the normal uh, duties of the pastor, pastoral care, along with the Sunday service. Meetings, um, youth, if there's any youth services or meetings going on. You can con get in contact with her through Tina for now, because we're, we're still working that out. But going forward, the spiritually speaking, there will be more information on Lucia's jobs and our progress in the interim search. Without further ado, my name is Lucia Jackson. I'm your bridge pastor. I've never been a bridge pastor before, so uh, this is a learning curve for me as well, although I have many years of experience uh, in, the, in the pulpit. Um, so you might wonder what is a bridge pastor, and that means that I am your pastor while you search for your interim pastor. An interim pastor is somebody who's trained to be in a church during the interim time between settled pastors. I'm the bridge while you look for your interim pastor. Um, so that means our time together will be fairly short, but also gives us an opportunity to do some exploring and trying new things because it's a short time. And if you don't like it, um, I won't be here that long. <laughs> but I hope that um, we have lots of good communication and I look forward to worshiping with you and getting to know you on the journey just for the next few months while you look for your interim pastor. I also uh, want to, uh, this is a new sound system to me, so just before we get into worship, is the sound working for everybody? Yeah. Not too loud, it's okay? Um, just right? Okay, great. I worked in a small, uh, physically small church in Vermont, and was used to really having to project because we didn't have a good sound system, so I'm trying to not yell at you um, since there's a sound system here. I'd also like to suggest that we take a moment before serving worship to just greet one another in Christian love. I know a lot of people right now aren't comfortable shaking hands, but just turn around and greet the people who are sitting around you in church so you know who's maybe slipped into the pew behind you or in front of you while you were here. Just let's take a moment and greet one another. <laughs> Draw us into you 
that we may hear your still small voice and heed your word. And now we'll join in singing from the Black Hymnal. There's a sweet, sweet spirit, number 293.
to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but for, not for God. For God all things are possible. I know you all have been worshipping in this sanctuary space for a while now, but I have to tell you that uh, Michael and I have not worshipped in the sanctuary space since March of 2020. We've worshipped outside, but this is really exciting to be in the sanctuary space, to be singing hymns and have a choir singing an anthem. <laughs> it's amazing. Not, not too long ago, we wondered if this would ever happen again. Um, let, us, let us not have it become commonplace too quickly. <laughs> Let us appreciate the wonder that we're able to be together. And let us pray. Lord, bless the words of my lips, the meditation of all our hearts, that they may be glorious in thy sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Now, I am privileged to have some wonderful clergy colleagues. And I'm betting that this isn't part of your normal conversation. But when I meet with my clergy friends, one of the very first questions is, what are you preaching on this week? And let me tell you, I was really interested in my colleagues' answers on Wednesday. <laughs> because you know, this story of the camel and the eye of the needle, well, it's a tough one, isn't it? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Well, let's hope that camel has been on the diet. Because I know that this text has always scared me. When I asked that question, what are you preaching on this week? And shared my discomfort and struggle with the story of the rich man and Jesus. My dear friend in ministry, Mandy, and you'll probably hear about Mandy again because we meet every week and talk about scripture. Mandy told this story. A couple of years ago, the person in charge of planning worship at the Vermont Conference annual meeting had a family crisis. So only a month ago, I, Mandy, was pulled in to plan a few of the services. With very little time to talk it through, let alone rehearse, several of us devised an impromptu skit based on this passage. One of us read the passage, and then a few of us stood off to one side pretended to be friends of the rich man who had asked Jesus the question. Now, the interaction between Jesus and the rich man in our case was to take place off stage. And the plan of the skit was that we were just going to run into her after she met with Jesus. Well, you know how these things go when you haven't rehearsed them? You feel awkward and wonder if you feel, if you look as foolish as you feel. Anyway, we stood milling around saying things to each other like, do you think she'll dare? I wonder what he'll say. Do you really think she'll join up with him? You know, travel with his group and such? Well, with that design or luggage of hers, that was all packed up this morning. On and on we went, talking ourselves into the skit, even as we were presenting it to others. Then our rich woman came our way. Well, well, how did it go? What was Jesus like? What did he say? Are you going? And she began saying things like, oh, he was really nice and smart, and, you know, it was really wonderful talking to Jesus. He answered my question. But am I going? Uh, no, I'm not. And when she said this, it was though our flimsy skit and reality crashed together. Why not? Why won't you go? We all wailed. And somehow, we were all real Christians standing together in the story, asking ourselves the same question today. What is stopping us from following completely? He wanted too much, she simply said. And I don't dare to give it all up. She said really quietly, then I become someone else, and I'm afraid to do that. Who would I be? And surprisingly enough, we all got choked up. Mandy says, I mean, really, in real life, in front of the conference, we all began to cry. We all felt that moment of choice pressing upon us in reality that some of us could choose to pass by to pass by Jesus' offer of healing love 
and to cling more tightly to our stuff and to who we are now rather than to God and to who we might become. That scared each of us deeply. You see, this scripture reading is just that kind of story. First, this is an offer of healing. It's a deeply personal story of who we are now with all of our baggage and possessions and stuff and who we might become in relationship with Jesus. And secondly, our possessions, our baggage, often interfere with our relationships with God, steering our focus from creator to creation. Although wealth brings many benefits and privileges, Jesus repeatedly cautions his followers to beware of wealth's power to lure their hearts away from God. So why is this first a story of healing? You see, there's a fascinating thing about this man approaching Jesus. A man ran up and knelt before Jesus and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Preacher David Bost notes that all of the people in Mark's gospel, this is the gospel of Mark, who kneel before Jesus and ask for a blessing, either have some dread disease or are demon-possessed. That is, they kneel before Jesus because they're in need of healing. And almost every time that Jesus orders someone to go, like he does with this guy, it is in relation to a healing. So what if this guy isn't just curious, but sick? He is heart sick. Somewhere deep down, the rich man knows. He knows that he is heart sick. And so, he seeks out Jesus with his question about heavenly, heavenly entrance requirements. Because he knows that whatever his appearance on the outside, whatever his faithful and pious life, he's still missing something. Something important. Something that matters. Something that is a matter of life and death. He is seeking more to life, a fuller, more satisfying, healthier, whole life. Jesus, what was Jesus' response? Jesus looked at him, loved him. That's the first thing we hear. Jesus looking at him, loved him. And Jesus really does love him. Maybe Jesus sees that all this guy has, his knowledge of the law, his piety, his abundant wealth, has distorted his sense of self and of God, and of his neighbor. And so maybe Jesus tells him to buy the best, so he can really live by faith in God, and in solidarity with his neighbor for the first time in his life. What should we like having when you think about it? Treasure in heaven. A healing. And like many of us who are seeking, and who know that there is more to this life, this man is afraid to let go of what he knows of who he is now to become who he might be. He's afraid to let go of what he knows and who he is now to become who he might be. Because even as we see, we humans always prefer the known to the unknown. Healing we see is often hard work and a little scary. We're each and every one of us seekers in the faith journey. Sometimes we're seeking comfort, sometimes challenge, sometimes community, sometimes solitude. Sometimes we're seeking physical healing, sometimes emotional healing, sometimes spiritual healing, sometimes community healing. And as in the story, Jesus might just be doing the same thing to us even now. Again, preacher David Lowe writes, Jesus might be looking at us with love and perceiving the deep heart sickness in each of us. Actually asking something of us, giving us something to do, something to give up or away, somewhere to go. Now don't get me wrong, this is not about our salvation. We are saved by grace through faith for Christ's sake alone. But what if it doesn't end there or better? 
what if, in one sense, it only starts there? That is, what if God isn't only concerned about our eternal destiny, but also cares about the life we enjoy here and now with each other in God's creation? What if Jesus looking at us with love, and what if Jesus is looking at us with love and asking something of us, or giving us something to do, or something to give up, or something to give away, or somewhere to go, what if we, what we hear is challenging and hard and uncomfortable is really the offer of healing and of becoming someone new? My goodness. But if that's true, then maybe God's gift of salvation can actually free us to do something, to love each other, to care for God's people, to care for the world, to share the good news right here, right now, wherever it may be that God has placed us. Not from any hope of winning God's favor, but rather from a kind of spontaneous basking in God's glory. But that's hard. Deep down, we're too scared and sometimes too selfish to do that for too long. We're too scared and selfish and insecure and competitive and controlling and judgmental. We're all those things. And we're comfortable, really, with the way things are. And so many other things to boot. Because when push comes to shove, I have to admit that despite all the theology I've learned over the years, I resist change. I mean, I still don't feel like giving up all that I have, especially when I'm worried about financial security and kind of enjoy a pretty comfortable life. So I didn't really want to preach up the scripture. <laughs> Here's the thing you know that the world asks. What do you own? That's what the world asks us. What do you own? Well, God asks us, how do you use what you have been given? What different questions? How do you use what you have been given? Who might you and I become if we dare? Well, we have to know what makes us heart sick. We have to know what we are seeking. What are our barriers to healing? Who might you and I become if we dare? And I want to further for you as a church. What are the barriers to healing for this church community? Why are you seeking together as a community? Who might the mad voice of congregational church become if you dare? Remember the story I told at the beginning of the group acting out this scripture story and how the reality of the rich person's choice started to really affect the actors? It moved them because this is a deeply personal story of healing, a story of who we are now, with all of our baggage and possessions and stuff, and of who we might become in relationship with Jesus. And this is a deeply communal story of who we are now, with all of our baggage and history, and of who we might become in relationship with Jesus. And that's your question during your transition or interim time. Who might you become? So secondly, there's another message in this story. You know the one about the camel who needs to go on a really strict diet to get to the eye of the needle? The reality is that the rich man grieved because he could not part with his possessions. We need to remind each other that we have enough, actually more than enough, and share stories of when giving to others has brought a sense of satisfaction, of deep blessing that money alone cannot. Indeed, recent research shows that the only way money can make us happy is by giving it to others. Let me repeat that. Recent research shows that the only way money can make us happy is by giving it to others. In a fascinating TED Talk, Michael Norton, PhD in psychology at the Harvard Business School, shares a variety of experiments that convinced him and his team that you can in fact buy happiness, but only when spending money on others. 
So, stewardship team, you can thank me for that. And you can all go right home and you can look up this TED Talk. It's fascinating. I've experienced that before. And so I bet that you, that great feeling that comes from buying someone a gift, however small, or making a donation to a great organization that will make a difference in someone's life or in the world. But what I found rather astounding about Norton's TED Talk was not actually Norton's conclusion that money can buy happiness but only when spending money on others. What I found astounding is that this is somehow news. Okay. What surprised me is that it takes a psychologist teaching at Harvard Business School to demonstrate this. Because really, it's our faith story. It's our faith story. A story of generosity and abundance. Our scripture witnesses over and over again to the joy of giving to others. It's not news. The world asks, what do you own? Well, God asks, how do you use what you have been given? Who might you and I become if we dare? The rich man grieved because he could not part with his possessions. We need to remind each other that we have enough, more than enough. We also may struggle with an imagination dominated by the sense of scarcity and therefore have a hard time seeing the blessing of God all around us. That sense of scarcity is a big barrier to healing. And the move from the, uh, from the mentality of scarcity to one of abundance doesn't happen overnight, but we can start on that journey right now. So I'm going to invite you to take a moment and think of one particular blessing that you've experienced in the past week. And I'd like to invite you to give thanks for that in a time of silence. One particular blessing that you have experienced in the past week. Helpless, 
and hopeless. We confess that too often we do not see the wonder of life that surrounds us. Your gifts of family and friends, of beauty and nature, of challenges that rise up before us and dilemmas that halt our way. God, for all these, help us to be mindful and thankful. We stand in awe of your supreme love that bars no person, but welcomes people everywhere to your side. Whether we are first or last, rich or poor, we pray for your healing, O oh God. Forgive us the times we falter in selfishness and waywardness. Release us from fear and greed. We can be foolish. Cleanse us and make us whole again. Mold us again into your image and teach us your ways that we may live worthily under the grace by which we have been claimed. Amen. And let us pray together as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And let, our, let us close our worship with the hymn, All Things Bright and Beautiful. Amen. Amen. Let us go forth and join the serve from the new